Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. A very good evening to all. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. We are blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you know, take some moments, this opportunity, this time round of the day to reflect on what I think is an important uh, matter for us to look at. Especially in light of us going through this very challenging period, not just in Singapore's history, but I would dare say um, as part of the modern world history also. Um, I think in the last few years or last few decades, we have not really seen a pandemic breaking out um, this widely um, all over the world. But now we are tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with uh, this virus that we know as COVID-19. And for that, I'd like to bring our attention to reflect on uh, the idea of the fiqh of priorities. How do we, in, the, in, in such situations and conditions and circumstances, um, put in priorities, be it in our religious life, be it in our communal life? And can we actually find within the Islamic tradition uh, guidance on, on how we can actually uh, practice and put priorities as we make our daily uh, decisions in our daily lives. I think, ladies and gentlemen, um, when we speak about emergencies, when we speak about harm, about danger, we cannot run away from the fact that Islam, as a religion which looks into the welfare of humanity, it emphasizes on the importance of preserving our human life, our health, our welfare and security. This, I think, we see in many discussions by our scholars, um, in, in discussions of topics such as maqasid al-sharia, or what is known as the high objectives of Islam, of which um, Islam focuses on the protection of five main important things. One of it is human life or human uh, health and human well-being. And I think when we look within our Islamic tradition, we will find many legal maxims which actually um, encourages us, which guides us to be able to put priorities and to be able to weigh and then make a decision as to what should come first before others. Um, for example, one legal maxim which says al-darar yuzal, which basically means danger or harm needs to be eliminated. Now, the usual example when we study such traditional uh, uh, legal maxims is when you are in a situation where um, you have to choose between death or having to consume something which is prohibited by Islam. In those situations or in such, a, in such a condition, you have a thing which is prohibited, which is haram in Islam, but then you also have the risk of death if you do not consume this thing which is haram. In such a situation, what would you do? Do you continue then to stick by your principles and say, nah, I think I'll just stick to my principles and I will die? Or does Islam at that point of time allow you in that specific situation to then weigh the priorities between dying and consuming something which is prohibited at that point of time? Which should you choose? If we look at Islamic legal maxim, which I mentioned earlier on, it says al-darar yuzal. Harm needs to be eliminated. Now, in such a situation, if you're going to die, but you have something which is haram or prohibited to be consumed, then scholars, and it is a consensus of Islamic ummah or Islamic community across the traditions, across the generations, that you should consume what is needed for you to continue living, even if it is a prohibited or a haram um, substance or drink or food at that point of time. Just enough, of course, for you to live and survive. This is one immediate example. And that's why you have other legal maxims, so qawa'id fiqhiya, which says, for example, darurat to be hul mahdurat, which means the prohibited or rather emergencies, times of danger or dire circumstances would actually allow or permit you to actually do things or consume things 
which would have been otherwise prohibited by Islam, by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and by Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let us take a step back and then look at what can we find within the Quran itself. Because when you speak about danger, about harm, about weighing, you know, between your own life and and what you would want to do or what you cannot do, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says in Surah Al Baqarah, verse 195, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim, wa la tulqu bi-aidikum ila tahluka," which means, and do not expose or cast or throw yourself into destruction. Which means, brothers and sisters, if ever you are in a state where you may be exposed to something which is dangerous, harmful, which may bring yourself to you know, things which would inflict pain upon you, then based on this Quranic verse, you are actually taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you should avoid it, refrain from it, and if possible, run away from it. Because this is the principle of Islam preserving human life wherever possible that we need to do. Now the same goes also when we are in such situation now. You know, over the last few weeks, we have heard the decision of the Fatwa Committee allowing for our mosque to be closed totally, to not allow people to pray in our mosque and instead encourage people to pray at homes or in their offices separate from one another. Now, people have asked us many times, you know, why are we closing our mosque? Why are we stopping people from practicing Islam? My question is, are we, by taking such precautionary measures or preventive measures, going against Islam? Or are we actually enlivening or upholding what is thought by Islam and what is taught by our Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and more importantly, what is taught by Allah subhanahu wa taala. Let me bring you to certain few examples of Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam because this issue of a pandemic and outbreak didn't happen only in our times; it has happened across human civilizations. In our Prophet's time, he has witnessed what we would have witnessed today. He witnessed plagues, the outbreaks of pandemics and infectious diseases and viruses. At that point of time, it was known as Ta'un. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was confronted with such a situation of such plague and, and infectious disease and viruses, he had laid out a few, um, I would say, guidance as to how we should uh, interact or how we should deal and manage it. For example, in one hadith narrated by uh, Imam Muslim, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, La yuradu mumridun ala musih which means do not bring forth or do not uh, expose the sick or mix the sick with the healthy. This is a fundamental rule as what we all know today as non-mixing or we should quarantine ourselves. This is a sunnah of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not mixing the sick with the healthy or those who are not unwell. And then secondly, our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ever mentioned in another hadith narrated by Imam Muslim also, which means if you hear that a land has a certain plague happening in it, then do not go to that place which has a plague. But if you happen to be in the land which there is a plague within it, then Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, do not leave that. This leave that place. You see, for a person who, for example, is a trader during Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time, they would need to travel, they would need to move out of their place in order to be able to gain you know, uh, uh, trade with the others. They cannot only stay in one place, they need to exchange, they need to butter uh, a lot of commodities and whatnot. But by following Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's hadith or command, he is actually telling those people who would need to leave their country to seek for their own livelihood and their family's livelihood, he's telling them, look, yes, I understand, that you would need to find food for your family. You need to trade with others beyond the borders of your own place or your own country. But at the same time, at this point of time, because you are in a place where there is a plague and there is a possibility that you may have been inflicted with the plague, 
then it is only responsible. And in fact, it is a religious responsibility for him at that point in time to weigh again between my own family's livelihood and also the danger that I may pose to other people beyond my country, beyond this place that I'm staying and inflicted with plague, which one of these should come first? And apparently, our Rasul taught us it is part of our duty as a Muslim to ensure that we do not inflict more harm to other people than there is already within that place where there is a plague. Now, are we then saying that our Rasul Wasallam is, is one who does not have tawakkal, who fears uh, what they say, the virus more than God himself? No. What he's telling us at this point of time is one, again, upholding the importance of ensuring and securing the life of a human. Number two, to be a socially responsible Muslim. Number three, if you had to weigh between what you would want for yourself, but between that danger and also the danger that you may pose to many others, then at that point of time, you need to limit the danger as far as possible to the smallest number as possible. Now, there was one very interesting incident where our Rasul Wasallam he had a group of people from the tribe of Thaqifa. And this was, uh, by the way, narrated in um, Muslim again. They came to meet him to pledge their allegiance to him. And usually in the past, it was the norm. When people wanted to pledge allegiance to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they would do it physically. They would shake his hand and pledge their allegiance. At that point of time, this tribe, this tribe of Thaqifa, there were amongst them who had contracted this infectious disease. At that point, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, sent a messenger to them and said, I have accepted their allegiance, their pledge. I request of them that they may then return to their homes and rest. Brothers and sisters, again, this is our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doing something which we are hearing more of today. Quarantine, social distancing, not shaking hands, reducing physical contact. This is our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is not just a health advisory, but it is also part of our spirituality to ensure that we are not infected and we do not infect others. Now, again, I'd like to bring to your attention that this in no way, therefore, shows that our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in any way you know, of less faith or had less faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, it is to ensure that by doing so, he would be able then to secure uh, or, or rather to prevent these such contagious viruses to be spread even further. These principles form the basis of our fatwa. This principle or rather this hadith has been known by many scholars to form the basis of a certain doctrine within Islamic law known as Sad az dhariya Sad az dhariya means to close the path or the path which may lead to harm, to danger, to things which are prohibited by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And why? Because of this. This hadith that I've narrated earlier tells us and reminds us that we should always ensure that we cover up we stop any path that will lead to any danger to anyone, especially to ourselves. Now, this, again, is what formed the basis of our fatwa. Our fatwa does not intend to tell people that you should not go to the mosque. Our fatwa is telling us that in such times where there is a possibility that people may be infected when they congregate in large groups, then at this point of time, the safe thing for us to do is to ensure that we don't congregate. Our mosque needs to be disinfected, needs to be clean, needs to be secured, so that then moving forward, hopefully, when the time is good, when everything is better, and when we are then returning to our mosque, we are then able to return to it safely, to return to it with confidence. This is one. My other last point for today is really this. People have been 
telling ourselves or reminding me, which I appreciate, that, you know, Ustad, why are you stopping us in these times of, of you know, tribulation from going to the mosque and praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It is in these times that we should actually go to the mosque and pray together in this blessed place called the masjid. Let me just bring to your attention what a learned scholar, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, said in his book, which is very specific. He wrote, he wrote it and he named it after a certain plague. He said, but in his book entitled, Badlul Ma'un Fi Fadlil Ta'un. He said this. He opines that to organize religious gathering in times of plague and pandemic, even if it is to conduct the prayers of istisqa, which is to seek prayers to seek rain. Such congregation is a form of bid'ah. Such congregation should be avoided. But why? Why does he say so? For one simple reason, because it is against the sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam to be doing something which can then endanger other lives or risk people to being exposed to infectious and contagious diseases and viruses. Now, of course, again, the fit of priority comes into play. Yes, you want to pray to God. You want to do it together in a blessed place, such as the mosque. This is an important thing that we need to do. But at the same time, we also have the risk of exposing people and then allowing people to be infected by the contagious virus that is spreading around, which we do not know which any one of us could be a carrier because we have had many cases or rather cases throughout the world where those who have been infected or tested positive with COVID, they are actually asymptomatic, which means they did not show any symptoms of COVID. They don't have any symptoms of cough, any sore throat, any fever, any running nose, no symptoms, but yet they are carriers of this. And if you have such gathering, there's possibility that that might happen. In fact, Imam Ibn Hajar, in his book, very interestingly, he said this. In the year 749 Hijrah in Dimashq or in Damascus, the group, there was a large group of the res, uh, residents of, of Dimashq who gathered with their leaders, actually, to pray together to seek Allah's protection from the plague that was then breaking out at that point of time. However, he said, after that, the pandemic spread even more. And then he cited another example, and this happened during his time. In 833 Hijrah, in Cairo, Egypt, he said there was an outbreak of, again, yet another infectious disease. And then droves of people came out to pray for istisqa, or pray to seek rain, because they believe that when the rain comes down, then all the disease will be washed away. So they all came out in droves, lots of people congregated to pray istisqa. However, he said, as a result of not avoiding such large gatherings, the number of infected people, which was only 40 before those large gatherings, then grew to a thousand people. These are examples cited by our scholars in their time, in their books, and these are traditional books. Brothers and sisters, I appeal to you. Today, when we do and we take all these precautionary measures, while we, want, we wish we could have an easier, more comfortable, accessible life as normal, we need to weigh our priorities. Yes, we would like to pray in the mosque. Nobody, nobody, in fact, none of us would want to see our mosque closed. But at this very point of time, the fiqh of priorities demand of us that in order to prevent the spread or the further spread, of this contagious COVID-19, we cannot but have to, at this point of time, in the spirit of upholding our sunnah of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to prevent the spread of any contagious disease, we need to have our mosque closed temporarily. Always remember, brothers and sisters, while the mosque is a blessed place, but our faith resides here. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, at taqwa ha huna. He says, taqwa, consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, belief in him, faith in him, Rasulullah s.a.w. said, ha huna, is here in your heart. So wherever you go, you bring God with him, 
with you. Wherever you may be, there is always a moss in your heart. Brothers and sisters, the moss may be closed, but the doors of forgiveness, the doors of rahma, the doors of heaven, the doors of repentance are never closed. Therefore, seek what we need wherever you can, whenever you can, because God is all hearing, God is all seeing. And what we are going through is but another test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we pray that with every day that we go through this test, for every inconvenience that we pass through every day, out of our belief that this came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we pray that it will bring goodness and blessings to all of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, protect our family, protect our country, and protect the world in us by or through us, by we taking the necessary measures, by us applying the fiqh or priorities in our daily lives so that we can prevent the spread of this disease. And with that, hopefully, things will go back to normal and we will be blessed with a better life in this world and in the hereafter. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.